Hello everyone, this is Chuck Carnival, co-founder of FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool, and one of the founding members of the Dividend King subscription service on Seeking Alpha. This is the first in a series of articles where I'm going to be looking at the importance of forecasting future earnings growth and or any other metric, whether it be EBITDA, cash flow growth, etc., as it relates to the success you can expect to have as an investor in a given common stock. As I point out in the written portion of this article, we can learn a great deal from the past. For example, we can study a company like Booking Holdings here, which, by the way, is the old previously known as Priceline. So this is one of the very fast-growing companies that you can evaluate and look at. And you can learn a lot from the history by just looking at this company and seeing how a couple of things, how fast the earnings have grown. Earnings have averaged to almost, you know, over 25% per annum. And you can see how stock price tracked that, even though we always have short-term volatility. So we can learn a lot by just looking at this to identify that this company is a company that has been very fast growing in, in the past. Now, when I go to forecasting, however, However, I also want you to note that you can only buy the future. So when you're looking ahead, now you've got a situation where there are a rather large number of analysts predicting about nine and three quarter percent growth for this company, at least over the next couple of years. The longer term trend line growth is a little better at about 13.6 percent. But here's the point I'm making here. You can learn from the past and learn that this has been a very consistent, fast growing company. But as I shorten the time frame, I want you to notice that the growth rate is changing and therefore so is the valuation expression that you're going to see because valuation will drive your long-term results. There's no question about it. When earnings growth is very high, like we see in some of these historical periods of time, you also get very, very high performance growth. If I look at performance over this time frame that I've got here, which is going back to 2006, you've got 34.6% annualized rate of return. No dividends here. This is kind of a clean example because you're strictly looking at capital appreciation, and that ties in very, very closely with the 31% earnings growth. But now when I go and look at the analyst scorecard on this company, if something else is very, very interesting here, I want you to notice that on the one-year forecast, the analysts have been very, very accurate, or the estimates were very, very accurate, meaning that the company either exceeded or met within a 10% margin of error the estimates that the analysts were forecasting a year in advance. And then in the two year, we see a very similar record. So if I look at that summary wise, this company has hit typically either met or exceeded analyst estimates. But I also want to point out that analyst estimates are now basically lower or have slowed down. This company's become an 82, almost, you know, over, over $82 billion market cap and total enterprise value almost 87 billion the company does have a little bit of debt but it is an a minus company but this is a pure growth stock now known as booking holdings but here's what was the real point of this article and the idea is that forecasting the future is the key and i'm suggesting that you start by looking at consensus analyst estimates going forward this is a trend line estimate and this is a closer estimate and so what you're looking for is to, to determine whether or not the company does continue to possess the growth characteristics it has historically possessed, even though the magnitude of that growth might be slightly different. That's the point here. This company is still expected to grow at almost 10% over the next couple of years, which is above average, by the way. And longer term, it's actually expected to grow at about 135 to 14% growth. And you should always think of these numbers as ranges anyway. If I go into another source here and look at Yahoo estimates, for example, and look at the next five-year estimate on Yahoo, the analysts that are reporting to Yahoo, which are a different set of analysts, are, are forecasting about 12.87%. Now, that, that's slightly lower than the 13, but it's within the same ballpark. These estimates should never be expected to be perfect. Now, what's interesting about this and what I showed in the article, and for those of you who are FastGraph subscribers, I want to show you something. You can go to resources here, and then you can go to previous research articles that I've written. And this, in this example, if you type in the word here in the search function key, 
this will bring up other articles that I've published in the past where I talk about the key to investing. And the article that I've been referring to and I'm showing examples of is this article that I wrote in, in March of 2013 called Forecasting Future Earnings is the Key to Successful Stock Investing. Consensus analyst estimates provide us a, a solid starting point. It's essentially a similar article to what I've published now. But in that article, I actually produced forecasts on the Fastgrass forecasting calculator on four sample companies that I included in this article. And you can see that the analysts, you know, were forecasting specific numbers. So if I look at Stryker Corporation, for example, this article was written in March of 2013. Analysts were expecting $4.33 for 2013 and $4.71 for 2014. So let's go ahead and look at those numbers, how they actually pan out. Instead of the $4.33 that analysts were expecting, Stryker actually earned $4.49 in 2013, as you can see right here. Additionally, analysts were expecting or forecasting $4.71 for 2014, and Stryker actually earned $4.73. And then when you went to 2015, the analysts were expecting $5.14, and Stryker actually earned $5.12. And then for 2016, analysts were expecting $5.60, and Stryker actually earned $5.80. Now, the point is, all these numbers are close to what the analysts were saying back here in 2013. So when I go ahead and look at the analyst scorecard and look at 2013, now this is when the forecast was made one year in advance. I also can look at what the forecast was when analysts were looking at it two years in advance. So these numbers will not be perfectly consistent with what I've shown you already, but I do want you to understand that all of these are going to be within a reasonable range of probability. So the analysts in 2013 were actually expecting Stryker to earn $4.73 at that time, January 1st, 2013, for 2014. The actual came in at $4.73. So instead of the $4.61, I may be getting these numbers jumbled here, they actually came in at $4.73. And then, you know, analysts one year in advance of 2015 were expected $5.20, and the company actually earned the $5.12 that I pointed out earlier. And then for 2016, they were expecting $5.69 and $5.80. So the point is, what I really want you to see by looking at this scorecard for as long as we can offer here, going back to 2009, once again, we see an example of a company that has met analyst expectations virtually 100% of the time on the one-year forecast and virtually the same when they were making the two-year forecast. Here's now the two-year forecast. So the point is, none of these numbers are exactly identical to what the analysts were saying back in 2013. However, the numbers are within that reasonable range of probability that I talked about. And then when you end up looking at what the results were, when you look at historical results and you know what they were expecting, they were expecting Stryker shareholders to earn about 8.6% back here in March. And I'm going to go to February, whoops, I'm going to go to February 2013 here. And now we see a situation where Stryker is overvalued. So when you calculate performance, Stryker shareholders actually earn 20% and they were forecast to earn 8.6%. But I do want to point out that had the market valued this stock at essentially what they were originally forecasting by 2018, Stryker shareholders would have earned about 11% instead of 8.6, which would have been pretty close. So I see this as an overvalued stock now. But the whole point of this is that when you're looking at forecasting, you're going to see the importance of how earnings growth drives total rates of return over time. So the key is we want to try to analyze these forecasts as close as we possibly can. When I look at the example of United Technologies that I talked about in the article, analysts were expecting actually a lot faster growth or higher growth than the company actually did achieve. You know, I pointed out in the written portion, they, they, they earned about 6.98% instead of 12. But as I also pointed out, 
shareholders still did earn a very respectable almost 8% annualized rate of return because the company did grow. It just didn't grow as fast. So, But I do want you to note that regardless of what the forecast was, the actual results correlated with what the company actually achieved. And that's why forecasting is so important. If you can get it even reasonably correct, certainly the direction. If, if you want the company to be a grower, not a shrinker. For example, you don't want to see it get into a situation where you're forecasting, you know, high growth and the company actually turns out to give you negative growth like you see with the Navon products. There's no valuation level that would work with that. But the key is most of the time when analysts are forecasting earnings growth going forward, you will see that analysts end up being relatively conservative on their forecasts because management likes to guide lower than they actually expect them themselves to achieve so that their stock price will likely go higher on an earnings beat rather than go lower on an earnings miss. Anyway, this is a series of articles where I'm going to be covering the importance of forecasting. I'm starting out here by saying start out by looking at analyst consensus estimates so that you have an idea before you've even done any work of whether or not this is a company that's expected to grow or not. And then in the subsequent articles I'll be publishing here in videos, I'll be talking about how you can get a little deeper into that forecasting beyond the analyst estimates. Anyway, this has been Chuck Carnival saying uh, thanks for watching. If you like what you saw here, don't forget to hit our subscribe button and I'll be posting new videos and new articles soon. Thanks for watching.